We are now going to be we joined by a guy who has who was in the who who that take two, who was in baseball from '95 to '06, played for teams like the Chicago Cubs, Texas Rangers, the White Sox, Toronto, and finished his career with the New York Yankees. And that is number fifty-six, Anion starts. Just waiting for him to connect it to his audio right now. Hey, Tanyan, how you doing tonight? Sammy? What's going yeah, we can, on? We can, can hear, hear you. you. I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, that... Should have blown my shit out for this group, huh? <laughs> <laughs> he sounds like he's in a galaxy oh, far, far crew. away. I can't hear you guys. Let me see what's going on here. Hold on. <clears throat> Hear us now. As you can tell, I'm really computer savvy. <laughs> can you hear us? Well, I'm going to try to do it a different way. Okay. Well, why my speaker's not working? <laughs> Oh, the fun with Zoom. Ah, the fun, yes. <laughs> this dude got shades on and everything, man. We got, I, got, I got to go clean myself up and come back on this thing. This is crazy. <laughs> 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 well, Let me leave and come back and see if I get it working. Okay. Gotcha. Got you. 12 year MLB veteran, Mr. Tanyan Sturtz. Hopefully we can. Yeah. You can hear can you us. Hear us now. Look at that. See, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I am good. What's going on? How you doing tonight, man? I'm good. How you guys doing? Doing good. Very good. good man. Very good. Am I on the show with ZZ Top or what's going on with this? Thing? <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Look at these dudes. This is awesome. <laughs> we love some rock and roll, baby. That's how we yeah. roll. Baby. This is a group I want to have a beer with. My goodness. Hell yeah. Hey, anytime. Anytime. Oh, anytime. Holy Give right, guys. <laughs> oh, where right. are you guys? Where is everybody at? I know. Jersey. Jersey? <laughs> I'm Long Island. Long Island? I'm about, uh, I'm about 45 minutes southeast of Chicago. Okay. I'm in North Carolina. North Carolina? Yeah. Uh, about 45 Ooh, minutes north of Boston. That, huh? This is awesome. And you actually have one from Boston. Where in Boston? In, in Boston? No, about 45 minutes north. Where? Uh, like Haverhill, Mass area. Dude, I grew up in Worcester, man. I know. I was just about to say, you're a oh, Boston. Really? All right. You're a New England boy yourself. Yeah. We're going to have to burn that hat you have on, that's for sure. <laughs> Wait, which hat? Yeah, that which, Fenway which hat? hat on. That Fenway hat. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah, uh, Carl. Oh my goodness! Look at this. How did I get roped <laughs> into this thing? You guys are you guys are sliding back down the hill very quickly. <laughs> That's why I say they're clear. What's but, happening? This is no. my attire for every show. I like it. That's all right. <laughs> he tries to be the Boston fan. He tries to be. I am a Boston <laughs> fan. Fine. Start with me. I'm not planning on starting with you there, but hang on. Um, we're actually on the one year anniversary of this whole COVID um, situation here. Um, wanted to ask you, how has the last year been for you? Obviously, none of us are living under a rock, but how's the last year been for you with the whole COVID situation? Well, listen, I mean, everyone's had a tough time with COVID, but luckily I live in Florida, so it's been you know, at least we've been able to live life down here and our kids have actually been in school the whole year. So that's been a huge plus for us. Um, yeah. You don't have to worry about the shutdowns or anything. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, so um, look at, like I said, our kids have been in school the whole year. It's been great. We, we've been very fortunate to be able to send them to class and be with their kids, be with their friends. I mean, they do have plexiglass around 
each one of their desks, but at least they're at school and at least they're, uh, you know, with other kids and, and being able to play with other kids and stuff like that. It's been great. We've been very fortunate. And, you know, listen, if you look at people in California, my whole family's still in Massachusetts. So, I mean, you know, you guys in Massachusetts have it pretty tough too. Lockdown's been hard. And, you know, New Jersey, New York, everything's yep. been tough. It hasn't been easy. The kids in my town, they actually just went back last week. I think it was uh, started going back last week. That, it's crazy, right? I mean, since I, like October, it's like, really? Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I work in a school and as uh, the day custodian and I'm having such a tough time trying to like space everything out in an old building of like, okay, they have to be six feet, but I can't do six feet because the room is only this wide and can only fit this many i'm also running out of desks and tables for these kids to use so it's a nightmare yeah it's been tough it's been tough for everybody i mean they, thank god none of us own a restaurant how about that no. yeah it's, yeah those, Ooh. Those, poor, those poor people a lot of the restaurants that are able to be open they've been doing takeouts and deliveries so they've been surviving but it's some of the other small mom and pops aren't able to do with half of it yeah. How about if you have a restaurant in Manhattan and you got that rent coming up every month and you're only doing takeouts and, and pickups? That's not going to cover the, uh, you know, your rent for the month for that stuff. That's pretty crazy. No, it's coming, not. You know? Yeah. But, uh, Carl? So, what, you played Little League when you were growing up, correct? Yeah. yeah. What position did you play in Little League? Shortstop. I was outfielder. <laughs> But so growing up in Worcester, what was it like playing Little League and then going into high school for you? Well, obviously, the biggest adjustment, uh, you know, is making that that step back to those 60 feet. Uh, you know, you, you don't think you're strong enough to even make it to, to throw it that far. Uh, you know, it, listen, it's a big difference. You know, you go from Little League to Babe Ruth to you know, you go to high school and stuff like that. And it's a, it's a big step. Um, obviously, growing up in the Northeast, it's different because we don't get to play as many games as these kids do down here or on the West Coast or down South. And so, you know, we all, I mean, I'm sure all you guys did, we all played different sports because there wasn't really a big season for each sport. So we didn't play 100 baseball games. We played 15 to 20 baseball games. And then you played yep. 15 to 20 basketball games and you played 15 to 20 football games. So it was completely different for kids. I think growing up where we grew up in the Northeast, because the weather dictated what you were basically going to play. So and God it, forbid we got rain it, or snow. I mean, listen, yeah. I, remember, I remember playing some high school games and, and it was snowing outside, uh, you know, for oh. a high school baseball game. Yeah, you guys had a little bit worse up there than I did down here. Yeah, we probably had a little bit worse weather because we're, you know, we're a little more north. And it, where I grew up, I was a little more cl closer to New Hampshire. And it gets yep. a little bit colder and we get that big snow that comes yeah, through. Yeah, I actually, I know the town very well where you are from. Um, I got family up there. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you you, you understand what it's like. It yep. gets cold. And you, you know, the winters are, are tough. And... I don't know how my 73 year old mother's still staying there. I've asked her to move down about for 10 years and she hasn't moved. So, oh, wait, no, no, they're stuck in their way. Forget it. Yeah, yeah. There's, no, there's no getting them yeah. out of that, right? You Great. can't yeah, get my dad's parents keep going more and more north. Jeez. Yeah, the, it was Brentwood, Stratum, then York, then North Berwick. Like, wow. why do you keep going more north? <laughs> You'll be in Maine pretty soon. <laughs> But, uh, Kevin? Yes. Questions? So, <laughs> well, so my question, um, so obviously you had time with the Yankees, um, and it was during the heyday of the Red Sox-Yankees rivalry. Um, I guess my question as a mass hole, let's say, <laughs> um, what was it like as a uh, Boston guy, a Worcester guy, putting on the pinstripes, playing against the Red Sox every year, especially during what is probably the most heated the rivalry has been in the last 20 years uh, from 
pro- uh, like 99 to about 2006, 2007. Like what, what was that like for you? Like your, your thoughts, your feelings on that? Well, obviously a job for me, right? I mean, that's, that was the first thing for me is a job. Uh, <coughs> obviously looking in the stands and seeing my father with a Boston Red Sox hat on didn't help things. <laughs> So, I'm sorry for laughing, but it, I can uh, picture it. You guys, but you guys understand exactly where I'm right, coming from. Right, right, yeah. right. Yep. You know, because they're not going to change their ways. Just like we said, they're not going to move down here. They're not going to move. They're not going to change their ways. So uh, I remember Derek Jeter taking the Red Sox hat off my father and putting a Yankee hat on and it stayed on for about a second. <laughs> wasn't that actually on TV? Yeah. Uh, no, it wasn't on TV, but it was oh, on TV, come on. Uh, outside the clubhouse. But it, it was just, it's funny because like you said, they're so set in their ways, it's just not going to change. But to go back to it, it, it was, I didn't look at it as a Boston kid. But, you know what I mean? I mean, obviously, growing up, I wanted to be a Red Sox. Obviously, you know, all of us dream of playing in Fenway Park because we go all the time, right? I mean, we, we go as kids, or at least we got to go as kids back then. I mean, kids now, it's $500 a ticket or whatever it is. And so it's <laughs> tough to get there. But back when we did, we used to sneak in. And go into the bleachers and you know you could get through that back fence back there where they had that hole we would all know where the hole was to get into a game so we would sneak in but you know it was always a dream of mine to play in Fenway Park uh, obviously I never got the opportunity to put the Red Sox uniform on um, the next best thing probably was for me being a Yankee uh, because I got to go there you know half the time <coughs> and play them. And so it was you know being in Fenway but it was always a nightmare for me because everybody comes out of the woodwork and wants tickets, right? I mean, right. some dude that I don't even remember was my best friend in eighth grade wants a ticket with his kids, you know, and I'm getting messages in the clubhouse in my locker asking for four tickets for tomorrow night. And it, it was just, you know, so it's a tough place. It was a tough place for me to go to uh, for that reason. But other than that, um, listen, I always, I loved going there. Uh, my first start was in Fenway Park as a ranger, actually. And uh, we had two other Massachusetts guys on the team with me, which was Kenny Hill and Bobby Witt. Wow. Wow. So, so when I was getting ready for my first start, we flew, into, we flew into Boston and we went to dinner. And he told me, he said, listen, these guys never took us. So we don't ever let them let that down. We don't lose in this ballpark. And that always stuck with me throughout my whole career about, listen, we have to do well as Massachusetts kids here at home. So we had, we had to always, uh, you know, take that Massachusetts thing and say, look, at you guys screwed up by not taking the Massachusetts kid. L- listen, it's everybody's dream, whether you're from New York, Chicago, or whatever, it's your dream to play at home, right? I mean, that's yep. what everybody wants to do. And, and so, you know, when that doesn't happen, it kind of burns a little bit because you are in the big leagues, you are good enough to play there, but yet you, you didn't play at home, right? So it's a little bit different. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Steven? So you've been around the block, obviously, throughout your entire career. You were a White Sox. You were a Cubs guy, Rangers, you know, Rays, all this other stuff, Dodgers, Yankees. Um, what were some games that you had in your career that you were like, man, that, that was one of the best games I ever played? And what are some memorable games throughout any of your tenures with any teams in your career? First of all, thanks for listing all 25 teams that I played for. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. That was good. I, I actually, I got a lot of really cool jerseys up on the wall, but they're all mine. You know what I mean? For <laughs> there you go. But uh, listen, the best, probably the highlight of my career, um, I wouldn't say highlight of my career because obviously playoffs against the Red Sox were the best, right? So any of those games you could pick, especially 0-4. Uh, you know, going down when, when, you know, they ended up coming back and beat us, but it was still, I mean, oh. the whole series was just unbelievable. I mean, yeah, um, it, was, it hurts me that we didn't win, but the series was just amazing, right, to play in it. But I think my, my greatest, the best game that I always talk about and I always look back at is I picked the first game back after 9-11 at Yankee Stadium against Roger Clemens. Yeah. And I was a devil wow. right the time, and I was a wow. starter at the time. So, uh, I got the opportunity to, to pitch that game. I remember sitting in the bullpen crying with two police officers before the game started. And then I went out and pitched the game uh, and ended up beating Clemens uh, two to one or something like that, three to one or something like that in that game. And, uh, you know, that, that was probably 
the best highlight of a game that I, that I could be right. Because after that, it all happened, being able to come back and play baseball and seeing all the people lined up underneath the Yankee old Yankee stadium. I don't know if you, any of you guys went into old Yankee stadium, but old Yankee stadium downstairs in the tunnels was really, really narrow. Uh, you couldn't fit a lot of people. So they were lined up everywhere because they were going out to hold the flag for the national anthem and stuff like that. And there was thousands of people. <clears throat> so I walked past all of those guys to get to the bullpen and obviously gave high five to everybody. You know, obviously being a visiting player was completely different, but uh, it was amazing. And um, that, that game will, I'll always remember as, as probably my best. Wow. Wow. Uh, Ezra. First of all, uh, Tangan, first of all, thank you for coming on. This is actually my first interview, so I'm a little nervous, but it's an honor to <laughs> talk with you nonetheless. Nervous. Uh, nothing um, nervous about. I'm, I'm all the way in a camera way away from you. There's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, grew, I grew up a White Sox fan. My dad, who just passed away uh, a few weeks ago, God rest his soul, he was a huge Cubs fan. And I wanted to kind of get your uh, – kind of your uh, – remember it's on your times in both both the Cubs and the White Sox what it was like playing for both teams I know you only played one season in each of those teams but can you give us a little bit on what it was like playing in Wrigley and and uh what was at the time Comiskey Park yeah yeah uh, you know sorry for your loss um I hope that you guys you know prayers are with you you and your family but um when I was, when I got traded to, not traded, when I got rule five to the Cubs, so you guys understand rule five, rule five is when you're not protected on something and you get picked up in the big leagues and you make the team on a spring training and stuff like that. Yeah. I wasn't really ready to be in the big leagues. Um, you know, I was just getting into triple A. I was really just learning how to pitch, to learn how to pitch. And, and I got rule five because I threw hard, right? So I, and, and I, so they, they picked me up and they weren't expecting the Cubs to be, good right i mean let's talk let's face it they were always not very they were not very good well the starting five that year ended up pitching really well the first beginning part of the season mm. uh you know castillo traxel and all those guys they pitched really really well so um i ended up being the long guy of the bullpen and just kind of really sat there so but it was a, it was a great experience for me bp in the morning at eight o'clock in the morning against fergie jenkins was not fun um <laughs> you know i mean he broke a lot of bats and you know, trying to drink with Mark Grace at night and then go to BP at eight o'clock in the morning was not a good time. Um, but, you know, Chicago, the Cubs, the, I mean, obviously the Cubs fan are just amazing, right? So, so to be in that ballpark uh, is obviously special. You know, Harry Carey was still alive. So it was a best, it was a very special park, uh, ballpark to be at. Um, I just, it was just really fast for me. Right. So, so if you always hear guys talk about slowing the game down and stuff like that, I wasn't able to do that at that time. I wasn't ready to be there and slow it down. It was just really fast. <clears throat> and the days kind of just kept flying by. And so, um, you know, the Cubs thing was, was great. Um, it got me my cup of coffee in the big leagues, but I, I wasn't really, I don't consider myself a big leaguer with them because I wasn't ready to be there. Right. Then you go to the other side and, um, I had probably the best pitching coach possible in, in the minor leagues with the White Sox that got me back to the big leagues and, and really taught me uh, I, my split finger pitch that, that got me to the big leagues, the state in the big leagues. Mm -hmm. And so, so White Sox have always been special for me. And I still have some very good friends that I met while I was playing with the White Sox. Um, not players, but guys outside of there that, that are all, um, you know, selfie guys, you know, self side guys that, um, I still very tight with, and you know the White Sox was a was a great time for me. They treated me great, and um, obviously that it happened there. They were playing well again, and they needed a second baseman. Ray Durham had just got hurt, so I got traded for Tony Graffinino and ended up going to Tampa Bay, which was a great move for me because I got to start for for the next three years and get my feet wet in the big leagues and learn how to slow that game down and learn how to pitch in the big leagues. So, um, you know, both very different for me, but both great, great spots. Listen, Chicago is one of my favorite cities. I love it there. Um, I think it's a great, great spot. The food is amazing. Um, golf is amazing there. I love playing golf in Chicago, but, um, you know, like I said, two, two really different times 
of my big league career, right? So one, I wasn't really ready, and the other time I was, I was ready to, to do some things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Tanya, as you spoke about the beginning of your career, I want to look more at the tail end of your career when you were with the Yankees. And you played with Jeter and Mariano Rivera. What was it like at that point playing with guys who were basically first ballot Hall of Famers? Yeah, so when I, when I got to New York, it was um, a, whole, a whole new, well, I had to learn a whole new mindset because they, they, they go by things completely different than any other team that I played for. So no matter what happened that night, it was over and done with by the next time we got in the clubhouse. Where other teams kind of just held on to that, like saying, oh, we lost last night by a grand slam home run. And they kept talking about it and, and it would dwell and dwell and dwell. But in New York, it was whatever happened last night happened last night. The next day you needed to get a win. And so once, once they started teaching me that, learning that, it was, it was a really great way to look at the game because, you know, sometimes, you know, we give up a home run or we give up a base hit to lose the game or something like that. Mm you know, you go home, it's not like we just forget it, right? I mean, you know, I mean, I know you guys as fans are all pissed off, but we're just as pissed as you guys. We don't want to lose ball games and we don't want to give up home runs, right? Yeah. So it, it dwells on, a, you know, we think about it a lot too, but the way they got it was the next time you get, next day you get to the ballpark, it didn't mean anything. We needed to win that night. So they looked at it completely different than any other team. And to have nine all-stars, sitting in the clubhouse or on the field at all every time it was just it was easy everyone always thought that oh it was the, must be the hardest place for you to go play they're not coming to my locker for a quote there's there's nine all-stars sitting around the clubhouse they're not, going to the, they're not going to the 24th man on the roster they don't care so i thought it was pretty easy you know um so, so that that for me was a little bit it, it took a little pressure off of you know everything that needed to happen because those guys were in the clubhouse because they were going to run the A-Rod's locker. They were going to run the Derek's locker. They were going to run the Sheffield's locker. They were going to run, you know I mean? They weren't going to run the Sturz's locker. You know, Sturz is probably going to be, unless I gave up a bomb or something like that, they're going to come to me first, right? Yeah. Right. You know, other than that, they're going to go to the other guys. So it was pretty, you know, in that, in that regard, it was pretty easy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Carl? basically the Yankees were, teaching you little league style. Okay. Yeah. You guys lost that. Let's move on to the next one. Yeah. Well, well listen, you that, know, that was their mindset. It, re it really was. And, and for them to be able to do that collectively as a team it, it is amazing the way that those teams all went about their business. Right. Because, you know, it was always about that next night because, you know, in reality, you can't take back what already happened. So why dwell on it? But, People do, right? I right. mean, we all do. If something happens, we all think about it. I mean, it's all ingrained in our head still. And Right. Yeah. Now, so, when I was coaching Little League, that's what I used to do with my kids. Okay, yeah, we lost yesterday. You know what? Today's a doomed day. Right. Let's go for today. Yeah. And it, 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 that's a great philosophy to have, you know. And also, people. yes, it is. And one of the things I used to teach my kids, too, was in order to learn what it's to mean to win, you have to lose. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, and a lot of, a lot of coaches are like, Oh no, we got to win, 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 win. No, they got to learn how to lose first. Buddy. We learned how to lose in Tampa. Let me tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it paid off for them yeah. in 2008. I'll tell you what, though, we had some good plane rides. I can tell you that though. We lost uh, We had some good flights. Actually. Um, sorry, John. No, I was going to say, do we have any questions from YouTube or discord? Yeah. Before we get to that, I so when you played with Tampa Bay, you actually played with uh, the pitcher Jim Morris then. Uh, no, no, no. He was so so. Obviously, you guys seen the movie, and and it comes in where he comes and replaces me in the movie. Okay, but but he but I never played with him. So they okay. filmed that a couple of years later. They filmed that a year or two later when we were in Texas because that's where he debuted was in Texas. Right. Um, it did, they made it, they cut out the stuff to make it look like that, to make him look like he came in. But I never did play with him. I was actually, I was actually with Chicago White Sox the year that he broke in with Tampa. Okay. Um, okay. We had played him before we went to the, uh, before we went to the AAA World Series with Charlotte with the White Sox, we played him in uh, Durham. He was in Durham before he got called up. Okay. Yeah. And also, my other question before we get to Discord it was, 
2006, you went out with a rotator cuff surgery. Yeah. How do you remember exactly what happened that made you have that rotator cuff surgery? No, I remember yeah. throwing as much as possible. And I just remember not being able to obviously locate where I want to locate anymore. Um, you know, velocity doesn't really go away that much, but mm -hmm. your feel for where you want to try and put something does. And then when that goes, especially in the big leagues, it's very tough. You know, I don't throw a high, I didn't throw 104 like these guys do now and just throw it down the middle. You know, <laughs> I, I had to put it on the corners and try to make it move a little bit. So, um, you know, once that, once that went, um, and it was, it was quite painful. So then we knew, you know, in hindsight, now that I look at it, I really wish I didn't have the surgery. I really wish I rehabbed for the rest of that year and waited till the end and then, and then had it done in the off season or something like that. But, um, you know, the doctors all were saying you had to get it done. So I, I went to Dr. Andrews in, in Birmingham and, and got it done. And that was basically pretty much the end. Of I think we everybody goes to him for surgery. Yes. Well, yeah, he was the best. He was the best, you know, I mean, he's, he's the best at the time. And, and uh, you know, all the doctors that study underneath him are the best. And they're all right there in Birmingham. The place is massive. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So we actually have YouTube and Discord uh, that we're on. And I have a comment from Discord, if you don't mind taking uh, the yeah. question. Whatever you guys need. So a good friend of ours, uh, Todd Tomlin, turns around and says, um, what do you think of the way the game is played today versus old school where players were also bunted, stolen bases, just overall small ball type of mentality? Yeah, that, that, listen, that's a great question. Um, I, I hate the game now. I, I, I very rarely watch a game. I can't stand it. I think it's a strikeout, a walk, or a home run. I, I really think the game is re really lost on what the way we used to play it. I, I really, I really think that they have to sit down and look, you know, you kind of see a couple teams trying to get back to, you know, moving the runners over. I mean, you never see a guy on second base with less than two outs trying to get him over the third base. I mean, it just doesn't happen anymore. Right. And like he said, at the right. bunk, I mean, we just don't, the, the game just doesn't do it anymore because they don't get paid for it. These guys get paid a lot of money to hit 20 home runs, a 25 home runs. So the game has changed and you can't blame the kids for that because they're trying to get paid and take care of their families, which is fine. But, you know, back, you would never see a guy strike out 200 times back when we played. He would be sent down to the minor leagues, right? Yep. He, he yep. wouldn't have the opportunity to strike out 200 times, mm -hmm. you know? So, and now, I mean, these guys are striking out like crazy and, but they hit 25 home runs. So they're still getting paid. Uh, I, I just, listen, I, like I said, I don't watch a lot of baseball anymore because I think that the game has, really changed we can't drill anybody anymore right you know as pitchers the inside of the plate is completely gone um you know and, and, I, and I you watch these guys come out of the bullpen they all have amazing amazing arms but where they don't even they don't even try to put a pitch on a corner or something like that they're just trying to blow them away the whole time that they're in the game right i mean it, it's just power against power and if you catch up to it and catch it Okay, you got it. That's it. You know, they just try to throw it harder and harder and, and see what, what, what can happen. It's just the game, the game's completely different now than when we played. Like, the, you know, there was, there was an, I don't want to say an art to it, but there was, there was something to the game back then. Like, you had to think about nostalgia. Yeah. There, but there was, there was situations that you had to think there was something going to happen. Now you don't. You're just up there firing. Right. right. I mean, I mean if, you, if you think about it, every North American major sport, the game isn't the same with anything like football, basketball, baseball, hockey, everything. I mean, well, hockey's kind of, you know, the same, but, <laughs> but, but football and basketball, especially in baseball, those three sports have changed over the years. It's a different mindset these days. Back in the day, these guys did anything and everything, you know, instead of going out there and shooting threes and, oh, swinging for the fences all the time. No, you got to play smart. Yeah, right. Well, listen, I mean, you, you, we used to have guys you know, hit 300. You know what I mean? You would hit to do was guys first, second, battle. <coughs> they would hit 300. These guys, 
What, what, I mean, they're hitting like 250, 260. I mean, come on, man. Yeah, come on. They, they got 15 home runs or 20 home runs, and they're still getting their big money. So, listen, like I said, you can't blame the kids playing now because oh, no. that's, that's the game that they're in. But it's completely, completely different than when we played. Um, Tanya, another part of the show is we take calls. And we actually have somebody who would like to ask you a question. Are you okay with that? Yeah, of course. All right. Um, hi, Jack. I know you're in Disco right now. Unmute yourself. Come on in. You're, you're on right now with Tanya Sturtz. What's happening, boys? What's going on? What's up, brother? What's up, brother? What's up? Doing all right, Tanya. How you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good out here in the West, to be exact. Oakland, a uh, couple questions for you. I am a diehard A's fan, been a season ticket holder for the past uh, 20-something years. One question I wanted to ask you, when you came through to Oakland, honest opinion, what did you think of the Oakland Coliseum? Well, well listen, o Oakland Coliseum is obviously, you know, one of the oldest ballparks out there, so it's a great place, but... Um, let me tell you something. First of all, the best organization. I was so happy I got drafted by them because, man, I'll tell you right now, they taught me so much about the game, uh, being in that organization. Oakland, Oakland A's organization is probably one of the top organizations. I'm so happy I had my minor leagues with those guys. I really do. Um, it's a great, great place. Oakland Coliseum is a great place to play. I mean, obviously, as a pitcher, it, it's one of the best spots because you got all that foul ground. So I, I'll go out there and throw all day long at that place. You take my chances because those pop-ups are going to be up. So I liked it there, but um, you know, great ballpark, uh, obviously tough place to get to. Uh, you know, when we stay in San Francisco, I'm going to come down and to get into Oakland for the games and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. I, I mean, I always enjoyed playing there and always enjoyed pitching there. By the way, I, got just, you, got I was just with Jambi last week out in Las Vegas, and uh, listen, uh -huh. still, still one of my one of my my favorite guys in the world, and he was my roommate in the minor leagues. And then we ended up being together with the Yankees. So, uh, listen, I, you know, Oakland is very special to me. I still, we have forty of us that are still from the minor leagues, all still together on text messaging and still talk a lot. So. Oakland's very, very special to me. It's a great, great organization. Stay, stay with those guys. They're great. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going anywhere, my man. I, I just only wish we could have saw you up in the uniform up here for us for a few years, you know? I would have loved I want, it. I want to ask you, though, how did you feel from when you got drafted to the very first time you stepped on the field in a first start or a relief appearance? How, how, did, how were those two different feelings different and how did you feel during those two uh, opportunities okay so I, I got drafted in 1990 as a well I was a shortstop like I told you guys you know, I didn't pitch much I threw but you know I mean pitching wasn't my thing so uh, when I got drafted they told me they wanted to change me to a pitcher so when I went to Scottsdale Arizona with the Oakland A's and um, I had to learn how to pitch so I would do early work every day with one of my coaches uh, on my mechanics and everything so that really was, was the beginning for me. And then learning how to actually pitch to a batter was completely, uh, you know, instead of just trying to overpower somebody with a fastball like you can do in Little League or a little uh, also <laughs> in high school, you can't do that there. Uh, you have to pitch and learn how to set the guys up and learn how to get them out. But um, as, as Philly going into, I, I was, I actually ended up lighting King relieving a lot better than I did starting. Um, I hated having the four days in between my starts because if you got shelled, it was a long four days. And if you dealt, it was a very fast four days. And every time out of the bullpen, you knew you had that chance to go up every night. So um, it was a little bit different feelings both ways. All right. And one last question, if you guys don't mind. Right ahead. When you were, when you were pitching, out of all honesty, Ricky Henderson is my favorite player in the game. When you had one of the fastest runners on first across from you, who made you sweat the most standing on first and you're sitting there saying, oh, shit, I can't let this guy get the yeah. second. Yeah, well, thank God I didn't have to throw when Ricky was at first base because that probably would have been the person. Um, but um, listen, th there's guys that can change games like that. Obviously, David Roberts did it to us in the 04 series. And... Um, you know, there's definitely guys you have to pay attention to. 
but like I said, you know, we're prepared for that before the game. We know exactly who those guys are and how to handle it. And the catchers also let us know uh, with certain signs on how to control that running game, whether, you know, where they want the ball and how they want to do it, holding, stepping off, throwing over the first, pitching out and stuff like that. So, but the, you're right. There's definitely guys that, um, you know, can change the game by what they can do on the base pass with their speed. And this, this there's, a, there's a few guys now in the game that can do it too, that uh, have that opportunity. You know, obviously no one I think will ever be like Ricky did on changing game, but because Ricky had power too. You know, Ricky didn't just hurt you with his legs. Ricky could swing the bat, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Thanks, man. Appreciate it, man. God bless and, you. And, and I got a question for you, though. I, the way you sound, man, you got to have a beard like these guys. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> he does. <laughs> I, he, I have about a 10-inch long goatee, brother. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I got my thing working here. This is not good. All I got to say awesome. is... All I got to say is look up Scott Ian from Anthrax. The band Anthrax, that's what he looks like right I there. Love it. Great. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I appreciate you answering the questions, Canyon. God bless Thank you, brother. You. God bless you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Kevin? I had a question a couple minutes ago, and now I, I just <laughs> oh, completely You had one job. <laughs> All right. <we're> Stephen. <laughs> okay. So. During your career, obviously, in the major leagues, when did you finally uh, – when, when did you think in your mind that, man, I finally have, have hit my stride, you know, I'm in my prime, you know, I'm, I'm finally getting somewhere where I want to be, you know, as far as a game or, you know, like when did you think you finally hit the peak in the prime of your career? All right, Steve, are you ready for this, buddy? Yes. All right, so I win 11 games in 2001, I think. 2001 with the Devil Rays, okay? 11 games with the Devil Rays felt like I won 30, all right? All right. So I win MVP for the team that year, and I think, okay, I'm, I got it. Now I'm ready to go, okay? Right. Next year, I go 4-18, and 18, bro. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, uh, so to answer your question, I don't think you're ever at that point where you think, okay, here, look at, I'm ready to stay here. I mean, I, I knew that I could pitch there in the big leagues and stay in the big leagues and, and right. get people out. But every time I feel like you get a little too high in this game, the baseball gods just strike you right back down and say, okay, listen, let's get back to reality, right? Right. You know? So, <laughs> so that's the way I always felt. But I, I, after 2001, I felt great. And then 2002 came in. I, I think I started the season like 0 and 13 or something like that. Like was, yeah, so it was, it was pretty bad. But I had like a I had like a 3 9 ERA. Like I wasn't pitching bad, you know. But we just I just didn't win any ball games. Yeah. So it was just like you know right back to reality. Here you go and have a little dose of this, right? Exactly. Uh, Ezra. <laughs> I had a question too, and it just spaced me out now too. <laughs> All right, yeah, I'll go to me now. I'll, I'll go to me now. Wow, we're doing great today. Um, Canyon, I know right now we're in the midst of spring training, and what's the mentality now for the players, knowing that the season starts in a couple of weeks? Like the mindset going through with the players, is it just get us to open in day, or is it, or are you not even looking at it like that? Uh, I think the mindset right now, actually being this close, is is get you working and don't get hurt because you want to make sure you start the season, right? So so right now, you see everybody just really getting their work done. And you'll start seeing a bunch of these guys, uh, you know, start playing some B games instead of all these A games and, and, and getting all these, you know, these at-bats. But now it's just really getting you working. Listen, man, you, you guys got to understand, this is a long season, right? Yes. The spring training is, is you know, it's really just to get you, to get you going. And, mm -hmm. These first couple months of the season is, is, you know, everyone, I always tell everybody, watch the first couple months of the season. All the young teams will be in first place because they're all, they're all, they're all 20 something years old and they're, you know, they come out like gangbusters. Mm -hmm. And then what happens right around All Star? Here comes all the other teams. They all start coming back. They all start circling back because they're not used to this long season, right? So all these other guys are used to it. They know how to pace themselves and get ready. So, it, you know, it's a it's a marathon when it comes to this big, this long of a season, 162, right? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. these guys just jump out. But I'm telling you, I've always told everybody this, you know, obviously I've been out of the game now. And so all my friends are like, you know, who are we betting on tonight? Who are we betting tonight? And I'm like, listen, take these young kids the first two months because they're going to dominate. They're, they're ready to go. They've probably been hitting since October when the season ended, right? Live off of a machine or something like that, waiting to get somebody. And so they're going to come out like gangbusters. And, and you'll see, watch, the first couple months of the season, you'll see these young teams. They'll be in first and second place. They'll be dealing. And, and then everyone will start catching them and start coming back. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Carl? So you were last technical last was in 2009 was your last time pitching. What have you done since that to now? Uh, baseball wise or just baseball like, wise. Uh, so baseball wise, I do. I do a lot of camps for Toronto. Actually, uh, I do a lot of the young kids camps up in Toronto. They go around. They're kind of special in Toronto because they have all of Canada, right? You know I mean? They're the only team up there. So everyone from West Coast to East Coast loves the Blue Jays. So what they do is they go around and they have these camps for these kids that are between 8 and 10, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And they travel from West Coast to East Coast. So I do a lot of those for the, obviously not now because of COVID, not in the last year or so because of COVID, but that's usually what I do. Um, I do a bunch of the fantasy camps for the Yankees. Uh, other than that, my son's in T-ball. He's only five. So I kind of just let him go. I, I sit in the outfield. I don't let anyone see me or anything like that. <laughs> I don't want anyone to even know. I don't even think his coaches know who I am, which is great. You know, and uh, I just I just watch him play. And that's that's basically it, what I do for baseball. Um, you know, my, I, I have a job. Uh, I sell uh, P&C and health insurance to, to big companies. And um, you know, that's my day to day, right? I play a lot of golf and I play a well, lot. If of you golf. ever come up to Jersey for golf, let me know. Yeah, I will. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, the, uh, the Boston fan in here remembers this question now, uh, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So a couple of years ago, uh, the Houston Astros were caught in their big, uh, cheating scandal. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on that, like what you thought as a former player and if you had heard of any teams while you were playing that were engaging in any type of cheating, maybe not to the extent of what the Astros did, but if it is a rumored every team does this little cheating stuff. Well, every team does the little cheating stuff, okay? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I don't know to the extent of what, you know, Houston went to or, or what, what it was, but um, listen, you know, as a pitcher, we would always have to change our signs and make sure we change things up because of guys on second base, because we knew they were getting signs, right? Mm -hmm. If you stayed with a certain sign all the time, you knew that they were going to get your signals and they were going to tell the bat. Why wouldn't they? Why, I, I, you know what I mean? I don't. It, why wouldn't they? It's my job to change them so you don't have them. You know. So I mean, I don't. I don't put anyone at blame on trying to, to get an advantage to win a baseball game or to get a sign because it's my job so that you don't get the signs. Um, you know the other things where, you know, if, if they have video of people and then relaying it off the video, you know that's that's not right. We have to change that right to be able to to make it a little more foot. But if you're, if you're standing on second base and you, and you see that I go first sign after two for the first five pitches and the next guy comes up and you tell them you got the signs and they give it to you, then that's my fault for not changing it up. Right. I mean, I think you guys would all agree with that. Right. Mm -hmm. But you know, if, if you're, if you're getting it off a TV camera and you're hitting a trash can in the dugout to let somebody know, then, you know, that's a little bit different because that's not really, I don't know, not the human aspect of it, right? You know, it's, it's, it takes a little step further. Um, but listen, everybody takes advantage. Everyone tries to get signs. I mean, I remember, I remember being on some teams where guys sit in the video room the whole time and watch, watch the guy starts the whole time trying to see if he tips with a glove, if he holds his glove different for a certain pitch, or, you know, I mean, if he, if he does the same signs, you know, listen, that, that, that's all part of the game. That's, that's been part of the game since we've all played this game. 
So that's never going to change in my opinion. But but the stuff with the video stuff, that's why I don't think these kids should be in the dugout with all these computers. I just don't think that that's, I don't think that's right. I mean, maybe I'm old fashioned, maybe I'm getting up there in age and these, you know, this, this new wave is coming through, but I just don't think there should be that stuff in the dugout. No. Uh, Steven? No, because but real quick before my question, they, they can use that technology to really uh, pull some shenanigans. Um, well, we saw it. I mean, we yep. obviously saw that happen, right? I mean, yep. that's exactly yep. what Houston was doing, you know? Yep, yep. yep. Um, so growing up, g- getting into baseball, when you were getting into playing baseball, what was a game or a certain player growing up watching before you got into the major leagues and all that stuff? Who was your biggest influence to wanting to play the game? Well, like I said, you know, I, I was a huge Red Sox fan. So right. Um, right. I go all the time. Um, I was a big Jim Rice fan, big Jim Rice fan growing up. And then, uh, and I was obviously a huge Rocket fan. So I was a big Clemens guy. Uh, obviously on the mound, I would always try to emulate Clemens, but uh, I mean, Jim Rice and Dwight Evans. I mean, I, listen, I, you know, I, I just loved that whole team back then when I was playing, you know, growing up as a kid and, you know, you sit in the yard playing wiffle ball and you want to emulate all these guys and stuff like that. And those were the guys that I tried to do. You know, Yaz, you know, flipping his back. So, I mean, all that stuff growing up as a kid. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ezra? I actually wanted to ask you, Tangit, about your charity work. I know that you were the advisory board chairman for the Pinstripe Sports Streams Foundation. You know, the foundation helps, you know, give youth travel, baseball players who can't afford gear, and allow them, he gives them the opportunity to play elite travel baseball. Can you kind of talk about that and kind of what in deep, give in detail what the organization truly does for uh, those young players who want to achieve their dreams? Yeah. So, so uh, again, this goes back to what I do with the, with the Yankees, with the fantasy camp. So, uh, you know, it's about a lot of older gentlemen that come to the fantasy camp. They pay money to come most, you know, well-off guys that come and play and want to play for the week with, guys that are ex-major league players. So a couple of guys in there were saying that the game's getting out of hand uh, for the younger kids, you know, uh, money-wise being able to play. And some kids weren't really getting the opportunity to do that. You know, would we, you know, be willing to be with them on this kind of stuff to promote and be able to you know, pay for these kids to do certain things? You know, they would pick, randomly pick some kids throughout the country. But, um, you know, so we obviously jumped on board with that because, you know, it's all about preserving the game. And, you know, it's not right if kids want to play the game and can't afford to play it. And and it's kind of getting like that with the way the sport is now. Everyone, no one wanted to play hockey when they were younger because it was too expensive, right? I mean, you skate, you know, you pad, your sticks and all that stuff. But now, you know, baseball is kind of getting the same way. You know, it's $2,000 here, $3,000 there, you know. So it's getting expensive. And, and, parents, and parents just don't have the money to do that. And it's a shame because we're losing a lot of kids, a lot of kids that can play. Absolutely. Uh, Tanya, my last question for tonight. In your entire career, was there one ballpark or one town that you always looked forward to going to? Um, I always loved pitching in Cleveland. I loved the, I loved the mound in Cleveland. I always thought it was great. Um, not so much the city, but the ballpark, yes, right? I mean, the city's pretty, you know, it's Cleveland, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, we have one of our one of our other good friends is a diehard Cleveland fan. Listen, the ballpark's awesome. I love it, right? But, I mean, it, 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 you know, it, it's Cleveland. Like, when you got Chicago, uh, you know, you have L.A., you have Oof. New York, you have Boston. It's Cleveland, right? I mean, let's just, you know, we'll call it what it is. But I, listen, I always loved being on that mound there because I always felt like the mound, the place was really – home plate was, was close. Um, and I absolutely hated going to Texas. I used to give up the booty in Texas, bro. I used to, try to, pull, I used to pull a hamstring before we go to Texas so I wouldn't have to pitch in that place because that ball would fly out of that place. <laughs> That ball would jump out of there off my pitches, man. I hated going to that ballpark, man. That place was tough, but it was a great, it was a good city. It's better than Cleveland. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than Cleveland. 
<laughs> better than Cleveland. Better he than just stole my next question. Oh my God, that was gonna be my next my next question. Uh, what yeah. was the city that you hated playing in? He just answered it, Texas. <laughs> yeah. uh, Listen, uh, I didn't hate playing in that city. I like that city. I hate playing oh, play play in the ballpark. <laughs> <laughs> the ballpark, the ballpark, man. Oh man! The ball would fly out of there. <laughs> so my question for you, my last question, yeah. it's not baseball related. You right. play golf. Yeah. Did you see the big news that came out of the Arnold Palmer Invitational this past weekend? No. One, the guy that won it shot 555 yards off the tee to the green. The ball rolled literally 370 yards. Who's that, Shambo? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, listen, he hit some bombs today. Did you see him? Play? And that was on a par five. Yeah, I saw him hit that ball over that water. Yeah. I've played that golf course a bunch of times. It's amazing where he hit that ball. Crazy. Yeah. He's a, listen, he's he's changing the game. You want to talk about game changing. He's changing the game completely with, with his power, what he's doing with the golf ball. You know, there's not other guys that can hit the ball like him. No. That's but, why it's an amazing feat. <laughs> no, no, listen. It, like I said, I've played that golf course before a bunch of times, and, and where he hit those couple drives is just—it's amazing. I wouldn't even think about swinging the club to go over the park. You know, right, uh, Kevin? Uh, so my last question for you: um, best catcher um, in your playing days, and the best catcher you think of now best catcher in the game now and the best catcher that I had? Yeah. Like, it, it, who's the best catcher you played with or the best catcher that was around when you were playing and the best catcher now? Well, I, I you know, obviously I don't know who, who the best catcher is, you know, for me because I, I haven't thrown to any of these kids playing now, but obviously Moline is probably the best now, right? The kid in St. Louis. I mean, yeah. He, oh, very, yeah. Very hard to argue that he's not the best. Um, the kid, the kid's amazing, and he's been amazing for a long time. Um, for me, I, I was actually very fortunate to have some really good catchers. Uh, you know, Posada's awesome. Um, John Flaherty, who was the backup to Posada, was awesome, and I had him in Tampa, so I kind of had him both situations in Tampa and New York. Um, it, I, I've been very lucky. I, I've actually had a bunch of, you know, great catchers. Obviously, the, the Chicago catchers, I don't didn't really know much because um, I wasn't there that much. But, um, you know, I would probably say Posada and, and Flaherty were my favorite two to throw to. And I got to throw to them most of, you know, Flaherty most of my career, seven years out of, you know, my 11, right? So uh, that, was, that was pretty good. Uh, Stephen? Uh, my last question, uh, uh, what was the best advice that you were ever given throughout your entire career? You know, like, like there was a point where you're like, man, you know, is this, you know, is this, you know, worth it anymore? But, but, you know, and then you've been, somebody gave you the best advice that, that always stuck with you and you're like, okay, you know, I, I can, I can, you know, stick with that because that made you, you know, feel better, I guess, you know, like, cause like, there's always, you know, times where players, I would assume that they have those parts where like, they're hitting their, they're struggling and then they get that best advice and then from a player you know, on their team or their coach or you, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so fortunately uh, when I got traded to the, to the Yankees, uh, mm -hmm. Mike Stanton got traded up. And when, what happened when Mike Stanton got traded out is Mariano Rivera didn't have a throwing partner. Mm -hmm. So I ended up sliding into that spot and I ended up being Mariano's throwing partner for the three years that I was in right. New York. Mm -hmm. So every day it wasn't just play catch and get ready for BP. Every day was a, was a session, a mental session and a throwing session with Mariano. And obviously every day for him teaching me how to be in the bullpen, because I hadn't been in the bullpen before. So being in the bullpen with New York was really my first time. So he taught me how to go about every day being a reliever because I, I had no idea about it because I was a starter the whole time. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I always, like I said, I had those four days off. Uh, I, I would play golf, you know, drink and, you know, have a good time for four days and then get ready for a start. And these, you know, every day in the bullpen, you have to be ready. So he, every day we would have a talk after we would play catch. Um, and he would tell me a little bit something every day about, 
you know, how to prepare myself to be, to be a reliever. So I, I think, I don't think that it was one specific thing, Steven. I think it was more of like, you know, the overall time that I got to spend with him for those three years. And, and one of his biggest thing was letting, letting that day before go, uh, you know, and he was the best at it. Not that he ever got hit or, or ever gave up any runs, but mm. he was always the best at just letting it go, whatever happened the night before. Right, because you can't change the past. Exactly. You can't change yeah. the past. And there's no point in dwelling on it because it's only going to hurt you to, you know, to keep thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess we figured let's have the kid who made his debut on the show today, Ezra, have the <laughs> final question of tonight. So, Ezra, floor is yours, buddy. Not that I meant to put pressure on you, but floor is yours. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, during your time, I know the big rivalry in Chicago has always been Cubs, White Sox, the Crosstown Classic. Um, I was wondering, did you ever get to play during any of those Cubs and White Sox Crosstown Classics during your time? And if you did, and if you did, what are some of the, what what did, what did you think of the atmosphere whenever Cubs entered uh, Comiskey or when the White Sox entered Wrigley? What do you think of that atmosphere at the time? I think I only played in one, Ezra. I think I only played in one with the with the Cubs coming to the White Sox, and obviously, you know. If anytime you go inner city, it's going to be crazy, but, <laughs> you know, um, especially with the fans on both of those sides, right? You know, you, you can always tell the tension between the White Sox fans and the Cubs fans, you know, it's always a battle, but um, I, I, I only think I played in one of them. And I think it was when I was a White Sox and the Cubs came into town, um, but they came into Comiskey. And then I think I got traded like right after that, but, uh, you know, obviously crazy, um, but it, it never, it would never compare to Yankees Red Sox. I'm sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> nothing compares to that game. No, no. Oh, but let me tell you something. Nothing <laughs> compares to it back then. Now is probably a very good comparison because I don't think it's the same as the rivalry as when we were playing. Because, like you said in the very beginning of all this, this podcast was, you know, it was in the it was in the meat of the rivalry, right? Mm -hmm. Two thousand three, Booney hits the home run and, and the extra innings to go to the World Series, kind of put a dagger in thing. And two thousand four, yep. they end up coming back after being down three zero and, and, and beating us. And then 05, it was just like you know we had to fight with the A Rod fight and everything. So it was like you know everything was kind of you know coming to a boil at that point. And I just don't think it's like that anymore. Right. And then no. I don't know if there was like a wasn't a real hate, but there was a dislike, right? Between the two teams. You know, oh, yeah. It was a very it was a there was a, it was you had the respect and you also had the dislike at the same time. Right, 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 right. And then, and we knew that they really disliked a few guys on our teams and we really disliked a few guys on their team. So <laughs> Uh, I'm pretty sure Veritech is one. I have the uh, picture of him shoving his catcher's mitt in the A Rod's face. Yeah, I, well, I listen, had that as a computer background for great years. Guy, oh, Kevin, but Jason's a great guy, right? So I mean, it yes. was like, you know, it was just it, it was him that ended up boiling over with with Alex. You know, you know and it takes a lot for, for Veritech to get pissed. Alex, obviously, Alex was one of their guys that they completely did not like, right? So. So it just boiled over at that point, but it wasn't Jay. I mean, Jason, Jason never said 10 words, right? You know, he's very quiet. He led by an example. He did it. He went and played his job. He, he was a great catcher and he went about his business. So it wasn't really, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't really him. Right. No, no. Right. No. And I, I remember growing up in on Long Island, that's the last thing I'm going to just say, I remember those oh, at 03, 04, 05, those battles, between yeah. the Yankees and Boston. I mean, I still remember, I think it was 05, if I remember correctly, when Pedro threw Don Zimmer. That was, yeah, I, that, that was 03, I think. 03. I, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. Only, yeah, 03. Well, listen, that's what I mean. So all that all that stuff was building and building and building those three years. So, you know, it just I, the, the, the rivalry was just amazing. I mean, you yeah. would have people, 2,000 people sitting outside the hotel just to scream at you to walk on the bus. And I'm like, but these people got nothing better to do here in Boston than stand outside and scream at us walking on a bus. We have 50 cops waiting for us to walk outside. And what are these, these people sitting outside our hotel? But, it, you know, listen, it was, it was awesome. 
Um, being able to play it was amazing. Being a Boston guy and playing for the other team was completely, you know, crazy. Um, I had people with, with signs in the bleachers, you know, from my hometown calling me a traitor. Uh, <laughs> Oops. When I'm just trying to make money for my family. <laughs> You know, but, yeah. uh, but, but listen, I, I understand. I know where the passion's from because I grew up with that passion. I grew up with my family having that passion. I probably still have two uncles that don't speak to me because I put a Yankee uniform on. My <laughs> <laughs> father gave you shit a lot. Like, hey, you're, you're a Boston guy, but you're a Yankee guy dressing yeah. up Yankee. Come on. <laughs> right, exactly. And you, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It was an absolute blast. Great, man. Um, where can people find you on social media? And if you want to just promote the camp again that you do up in Toronto. Hey, listen, so so I will tell you that I have a 56foundation.org. And what we do is we, um, I do uh, I do big fuzzy socks for, for cancer kids in a bunch of hospitals down here in South Florida. And, um, you know, we, we, we do that. My wife and I, it's very special to us. We do it every Christmas, all the holidays. We, we send out big boxes of socks and stuff like that. Um, it's a great organization. We're very happy to do it. Uh, I do it because I'm blessed with two amazing kids. And mm -hmm. these kids, kids are, kids are very special. I hate the adults, okay? I, I don't like adults. Um, I love the kids. I, I really do. I, and really, they're, they, they're very special to me. And, um, you know, I always remember going to Fenway Park as a kid and people taking the time to sign autographs for me. So I always did that. I always tried to make sure that I did autographs as long as I could for all the kids that were in the stands and stuff like that, because it's all about our kids. Everything's about our kids. And to see these kids sick in the hospital breaks my heart. So it was just a little something for us to do. You know, they're always cold after they do their treatments and uh, you know, they give, they get blankets, they get pillows. So we thought we would do some socks. So it's 56 foundation.org. If everyone wants to go to that and they can find me there, but uh, you know, that's, that's something that my wife and I do here. Uh, we, we fund it by ourselves. Uh, you know, we do take a little bit of donations, but we, we order the socks through China and we get them here probably two or three times a year. We get big shipments. And, and we, we, we take them to the hospitals here. We have a couple of great hospitals down here in South Florida um, that, uh, that let us go in. And uh, obviously with COVID, it's tough. We're not, we, we're not able to go see the kids, but we get to drop off a big thing of socks so that they can hand them out. Yeah, absolutely. And we will tweet out that website uh, through our account yeah, and send great. it out to all of our, to our fan base as well. But again, Tanya, thank you so much for coming on. Hope to have you on again. Hey, I, I appreciate it. I love hanging out with the ZZ Top crew. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, you come up to Jersey, we'll play golf, man. Hey, man, I, you guys are on. I'm, I'm in. I really appreciate you guys uh, having me on. It was a blast. You guys are a bunch of great guys. And uh, like I said, we'll do a cold beer at some point, okay? Thanks, Absolutely. Boy. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Absolutely. All right, guys, have a good night. God bless. You too. Thank All you, everybody. God bless. <laughs>